A very good noon to everyone. We are sin sincerely apologetic for the slight delay that the session might have caused. My name is Animesh Kumar, and I'm the session focus point together with Mr. Amjad Abashir, the regional director for UNISTR Africa. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all for in the working session on international cooperation in support of the Sendai framework implementation. And I'm pleased to introduce the chair of the session, Minister Deswan Ruin. He has a long and illustrious history in the liberation movement as a youth leader in school in South Africa, in church and community. In the post-apartheid South Africa, he served as councillor, as the head of public safety, and later as an executive mayor of the local municipality and chair of the provincial South African Local Government Association. He was appointed member of parliament as ANC Whip of Standing Committee on Finance, and also as ANC Whip Economic Transformation Cluster. Minister Van Ruyen is currently appointed as the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs in South Africa. He holds a Master's in Public Development and Management and a Master's of Science in Finance on Economic Policy besides an Advanced Business Management Diploma. Minister Van Ruyen, it's my pleasure and honor to request you to conduct the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me welcome all of you to this uh, important working session on international cooperation in support of the Sendai framework implementation. Dignitaries, panelists, UNSDR Secretariat, distinguished uh, participants, it's an honor to be considered to chair this important session in the history of the global platform as we take the Sendai framework priorities and other agreements forward. We acknowledge that uh, international cooperation remains a key strategic area for disaster risk management, as we are all aware that disasters know no boundaries. International cooperation has been one of the key means to overcome the interconnected global crisis of extreme poverty, economic instability, social inequality, and environmental degradation. The world has become global in such a way that the movement of people from country to another has now become the order of the day. Either people migrate out of their own decisions, or some, as you are all aware, are forced to migrate due to extreme poverty, uh, but also due to conflicts as well as disasters. Some countries have already experienced significant levels of migration due to disaster, particularly in our beloved continent, uh, Africa. Every year, I must indicate that millions of people are forcibly displaced by floods, tropical storms, earthquakes, droughts, glazing, melting, and other natural disasters. Many find refugee within their own countries, but some, as you are all aware, move abroad. In the context of climate change, such displacements are likely to increase. This means that every country could potentially be confronted with cross-border disaster displacement, either as a place of destination, transit, or origin. To this end, the session will accord us the opportunity to reflect on the question of international cooperation on disaster risk management, inter alia focusing on the following key questions. To what extent can international cooperation be strengthened to ensure that there is dedicated and focused support to provide to underdeveloped and developing countries. Secondly, how can developed countries share and transfer their skills of building resilient infrastructure that will withstand extreme weather conditions? Thirdly, how do we develop coherent policies that foster partnership 
for sustainable development rather than our big, our commonly known big brother approach as opposed to sharing of best practice and providing financial assistance for development. And fourthly, how do member states around the world support each other to prepare for disasters and take measures to prevent threats to the lives and property of people, including preventing displacement, but also infrastructure improvements, urban planning, land reform, and climate change adaptation measures will therefore contribute to the reaching of, of both the, the Sandai framework as well as the sustainable development goals. I'm saying this, uh, honorable uh, uh, distinguished uh, participant, because we can only achieve our sustainable development goals if we put our efforts both at national and international level, if we ensure effective implementation and establish effective monitoring systems. But the, 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 the fifth point that this working session will, will also assist us to cover will be on how do we develop policies that recognizes that when conditions deteriorate, individuals and families commonly use migration as a way to seek alternative opportunities within their own country or, or abroad, rather than waiting until a crisis knocks at their door. I must indicate to a fellow panelist that on behalf of my country, South Africa, I wish to register our firm commitment to international cooperation on disaster risk reduction as succinctly pronounced in our current legislation as a country. I thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without any waste of time, allow me then to introduce the first speaker, and of course, the first speaker is none other than uh, the lady seated on my right, Ingrid Hooven. Ingrid, welcome. Ingrid Hooven is the Director General for Global Issues, Sector Policies and Programs at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. She has been working with this institution in various positions since 1986 as a special envoy for climate and development in the run-up to climate conference in Paris from 2010 to 2014. Ms. Wuven served as executive director to the World Bank Group representing Germany, but also was a member of the board of Gavi, the Vazin Alliance, she served as a co-chair of the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery and was a board member of the Green Climate Fund and the Global Environment Facility. I'm expecting inter alia that uh, Mrs. Hooven will cover the following three questions. The following three questions in six to seven minutes. What are the key financial instruments that the government of Germany has developed for disaster risk reduction. And the second question will be, how do these instruments promote international cooperation in general and support the countries with special needs in particular? And lastly, Ms. Hooven, uh, we are expected also to share some good practices, success stories, and lessons learned from countries where your government, the government of Germany, is operational. Over to you, Ms. Gerber. Thank you, this um, distinguished chair, for your inspiring introductory um, um, words. And um, let me also thank the organizers for having me here at this very important working session, um, at this very important conference, at a very important juncture in time, uh, coming out of a very important year, 2004. 15 on the Agenda 2030, the Sendai Framework, the Paris Agreement, and the Addis Ababa 
um, agreement, and this leads us now to revise um, action on the ground. Let me start by saying that Germany is deeply convinced that investments in disaster risk reduction pay off. And no matter what kind of scientific basis you use, but it's quite clear from the perspective of a development cooperation agency, it makes sense to invest in prevention. They save lives, those investments reduce infrastructure damages and economic losses, and contribute to achieving the goals of the 2030 agenda. And therefore, the German government invests in disaster risk reduction worldwide using different instruments and approaches. So when you ask me this about the financial instrument that we, that we use, we would like to underline that on the one hand, we mainstream DRR into our bilateral development projects. In high-risk countries, for instance, we integrate disaster risk reduction components in development programs on various thematic areas such as food security, education, or health. Here, disaster risk management helps to protect progress made in these focus areas. And this approach is very effective because um, disaster risk reduction and building resilience is always at core and center when we want to achieve the SDGs. It's simply the other side of the coin when you do development planning and cooperation. But on the other hand, we recognize that in some countries that are extremely often hit by disasters or extreme weather events, it makes sense actually to invest more focusedly in specific infrastructure. So we also fund programs that specifically focus on supporting disaster risk reduction capacity of our partner countries. For instance, we supported riparian states along the um, Niger River to be better prepared for frequent floods. This comprised risk assessments and early warning for local community systems and infrastructure measures such as embankments and dikes along the river. In case of disaster, um, Germany is prepared to react with a number of specific instruments which support our commitment um, that we made at the World Humanitarian Summit, where we said and stated that we want to increase the coherence between humanitarian actions and longer-term development cooperation. While our humanitarian assistance supports relief and early recovery after disaster has hit the community, in the German Development Corporation, we developed an instrument called Transitional Development Aid. This instrument is specifically designed for crisis and disaster context as it allows for flexible readjustment to changing conditions. So it doesn't have to follow the normal rule book that is in place for more um, traditional development assistance. Projects under the Transitional Development Aid combine short-term measures to meet the immediate needs of people coming out of a crisis, but it is being done in a way that this also strengthens the individual institutional capacity on the ground. So we build new structure and capacity for the future to be better prepared for this kind of disasters. So this instrument in a nutshell thus links relief, rehabilitation, and structural development and lays the foundation for long-term development during the early stages of the crisis response. Germany is convinced that the rich set of tools and approaches developed by the DRR community are also very valuable for achieving our goals with respect to the climate agenda. We support very strongly uh, strengthened links between the two communities and advocate for a smart use of financing instru instruments in both areas. Germany, for instance, contributes um, 700, 750 million euros to the Green Climate Fund. 50% of these funds will be spent on adaptation programs. And many of these measures that have already been decided upon incorporate DRR measures. Out of the 20, first 27 programs that were approved in 2016, at least eight explicitly comprise disaster risk management. What I want to say in a nutshell, there are new avenues um, already in existence that would give us the potential to scale up activities in the disaster risk reduction arena, instruments that stem out of the climate process in which we should take advantage more forcefully. 
but you also support new innovative funding mechanisms that help to increase investments by the private sector. In line with the Sendai framework priorities, Germany sees particular potential in risk transfer solutions, like insurances. We support the increase of insurance coverage in vulnerable countries through the so-called Insure Resilience Initiative. And the aim is that by the year 2020, we have increased the number of covered poor and vulnerable people coming Right now we have 100 million people that are covered by those insurance schemes to 500 million people by 2020. Why do we think that insurance actually is a good innovative tool and can, even, and can meet the needs of even LDCs and small island development states? Because we think that insurance can provide a very quick support to people affected by disaster. For instance, let me tell you one example that exemplifies uh, the value of these new tools. Um, after, the hurricane, after the hurricane Matthew um, hit Haiti in October 2016, um, it became quite obvious how helpful the so-called Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility can be. The abbreviation, therefore, is secret. Only after two days after the hurricane hit the, the island, the insurance facility provided Haiti with more than 20 million US dollars. And this money was immediately used to provide quick assistance to the affected population. At the same time, so Haiti didn't have to wait for the whole set of institutions to, to mobilize additional resources. And due to this, actually, um, additional support by the insurance facility, they were not obliged to cut back um, budgetary resources to other sectors um, as they had, uh, um, so the programs were still in place. But let me in very briefly also underline one additional um, advantage of insurance schemes. Normally they're set in centers for adaptation and preventive measures. For instance, the African risk capacity, which is supported um, by a couple of developed countries and is an originated in Africa and is attached to the African Union, demands that countries that would like to sign an insurance contract must have a contingency plan in place. So the work of the RSC starts actually with a risk assessment and the implementation of appropriate risk reduction measures, even before actually disaster hits the community and the country. So these are a couple of examples where we have developed additional and innovative tools that strengthen preventive action, bring in the private sector so that we can leverage the public money that is available and additionally provide a bigger cover. And um, of course, insurance solutions are not a silver bullet, but they are quite suitable in order to cover the, the remaining risk and make countries and community more resilient. Um, this I would like to underline that certainly more financial resources are needed. Um, and many studies have made the case that we should invest more in preventive measures in disaster risk reduction as we are going to face more extreme climate, more extreme weather events mm -hmm. also due to climate change in the foreseeable future. But let me briefly also underline the value of a strengthened exchange of technologies and knowledge. And I think this is one of the points that you raised in your introductory remarks. I think that this is also a case that we have to, to pursue more forcefully. Exchange of knowledge technology, not only North-South, but also South-South. For instance, uh, the Global Facility for the Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery, which is hosted by the World Bank and embraces a number of countries and agencies, has actually scaled up the knowledge about disaster risk reduction and standardized solutions. This is one approach that we are investing in because we, we think that this actually leads us to better solutions and best practice application in, in the foreseeable future. But let me finalize by saying that also in the field of climate risk insurance schemes, um, Germany during its G20 presidency strives to form a platform that would allow us to learn more about these innovative tools to see what kind of additional perspective we have in order to applicate them more broadly, what kind of complementary measures we should take in order to make them as useful as possible for poor and vulnerable communities. 
Um, and we hope that this um, new global partnership and platform gets the consent of um, our G20 partners. So far, I'm quite optimistic. I think this is an avenue forging together efforts and additionally actually sharing knowledge across the globe so that we get better prepared for what is coming to us in the future. Many things. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Oven. I think you are able to uh, answer all the questions posed uh, in the, the given time quite succinctly. Now, without any waste of time, I will go to our next uh, speaker, who is the lady on my left. Uh, I think I'm very highly, highly blessed to be sandwiched by two powerful ladies. Uh, the lady on my left is none other but uh, uh, Mr. Laura Tuck. Uh, Ms. Laura Tuck. Ms. Laura Tuck is the World Bank Vice President uh, for Sustainable Development. Her responsibilities include agriculture, climate change, energy and extractives, but also environment as well as natural resources, as well as infrastructure, public-private partnerships and guarantees, social, urban, rural and, uh, rural and resilience, transport, and ICT and water. I must indicate that prior to this, Ms. Tuck was the Vice President for the Europe Central Asia region, following 30 years of extensive experience in sustainable development across the Central Asia region, Latin America and Caribbean, Middle East and North Africa and uh, African regions. Now, Ms. Tuck, Inter Alia will be providing some more insight on three areas. The first area will be the role that the World Bank play in strengthening development, finance, and investment for international cooperation in support of disaster risk reduction. And secondly, what are the major funding instruments and channels of the bank for development and humanitarian financing. And lastly, she will take us through uh, some good practices, success stories, and lessons learned in supporting countries with special needs. And I, I hope that Ms. Tuck will be able to do this within the allocated minutes. time of seven minutes. Over to you, Ms. Tuck. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me start by thanking UNISDR and the Government of Mexico for hosting this year's global platform, including this working session on cooperation. As my colleagues who spoke before me, the World Bank is completely committed to achieving the Sendai Framework's target to increase the number of countries with national and local disaster risk reduction strategies by 2020, which is just the next couple of years. So this is a, a big um, agenda for us. But we also at the bank want to complement this target by helping countries to implement their strategies and hold their hands through the whole process. So all of you already know and you've heard from the previous speakers the statistics about the relationship between poverty and vulnerability to disaster risks and the benefits of disaster risk management. So I'm not going to go there. I only have my seven minutes. I thought what I would do is just walk you through some of the things the, the World Bank is doing. So I would briefly mention um, six things to support disaster risk and management in the broader context of the larger sustainable development agenda. So first, we've increased our annual DRM financing from 3.7 billion in, in fiscal year 12 to 5.7 billion in fiscal year 15, and the trajectory is very steep for us. The second thing we're doing is we're putting a big emphasis on ex-ante measures, like building early warning systems and building resilient infrastructures. And this we're doing globally across countries as diverse as Haiti, India, Malawi, and Morocco. Third, we're really continuing to work hard on the post-disaster recovery. We've deployed teams in 36 countries affected by natural disasters in just the last couple years. We've channeled $4.5 billion for recovery and reconstruction in places like Ecuador, Nepal, and Vanuatu. The fourth thing we're doing is we are now screening every single project inside the World Bank for climate and disaster risk to ensure the maximum um, uh, that we take into account the impacts and we build in all the mitigating measures that we can. 
The fifth thing we're doing is we're using all the financial and technical instruments we have to improve the impact on the ground of the DRM um, actions that we're taking in addition to our traditional investment lending. I'm going to come back to that. And then sixth, as you heard from Ingrid, we are very engaged in the insurance work. We are supporting several insurance facilities in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Ingrid just described them. We're working with the Germans on the INSU resilience. Now we have created a crisis response window inside of IDA, which is the soft lending arm that goes to the poorest countries, and that helps us rapidly allocate funds to the poorest countries after they have a natural shock. And this is what we used, for instance, in, in Nepal, where we gave $300 million after the 2015 earthquake. We also have this tool that's called Think Hazard that we've made available open um, to everybody who wants to use it. And this is a great tool because it can help users identify a specific project exposure to different types of disasters and the actions they can take to mitigate the risks um, associated with those disasters. And we have developed tools which we also share for modeling, um, using remote sensing. We have a lot of social media analytics we've been deploying to better assess disasters. We've created an open data for resilience platform that can facilitate the flow of critical information related to disaster risks and impacts. And we have a system now for citizen-led data collection on disasters and recovery that we used after the earthquakes in both Haiti and Nepal. So one of the things we're also trying to do is take all the DRM work we're doing and focus it on the poorest and the most vulnerable countries. So on average, more than half of the financing that we do on DRM with DRM co-benefits goes to the poorest countries. The, the um, crisis response window that I mentioned earlier allows the poorest countries for the first time now, we'll start in July 2017, to get standby credits like catastrophic drawdown options for disaster response and recovery. This means they can put the facility in place and then use it if and when um, it's needed. We also have a, a small island states resilience initiative, we call it CISRI, that helps small island states build larger pipelines of resilience investments, and they include activities like um, increasing the protection of coastal communities in Sao Tome and, and Principe, improving cyclone resilience in Samoa, scaling up adaptation and DRM in the Eastern Caribbean, and CISRI has also helped to bring a number of the small island states um, leaders here today to give them an opportunity to voice their views and perspectives. We are also committed to supporting the DRM agenda through a number of new and exciting, existing initiatives and partnerships. Since 2009, many of you are familiar with the um, pilot program for climate resilience, PCPR, which has committed almost a billion dollars to support resilience in 28 countries and to integrated climate resilience into development planning across sectors and stakeholder groups. So for an example, in Bangladesh, the PPCR is helping to improve climate resilient agriculture and food security, strengthen water security, and enhance the resilience of coastal communities and the infrastructure. As you know, Bangladesh is very vulnerable. We're also working closely with UNDP and the EU to provide joint support for over 30 post-disaster needs assessments. We have a Safer Schools program that where we're working with UNICEF, NGOs, and the private sector to help countries prioritize where and how to build and repair schools to maximize the protection of students. We have the Global Facility for Disaster, Risk, um, disaster Reduction and Recovery that supports the Sendai framework. Um, we are working with uh, the French. Some of you came to the session yesterday on a um, hundred million climate risk, hundred million dollar climate risk early warning system program called CRUISE. And on Monday, we launched the Global Preparedness Partnership with the V20 group of 46 climate vulnerable countries to help them bring at-risk countries to a minimum level of preparedness. So, bottom line, we're completely committed, and we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tuck, for your succinct input and uh, response to the post questions. Our next uh, speaker will be uh, Mr. Rintaro Tamaki. 
Mr. Rintaro Tamaki is the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. His portfolio uh, includes the strategic I'm sorry, I'm told that there are some changes here. In fact, instead of uh, Mr. Rintaro Tamaki, there is a replacement by Mr. Rolf Alter, who is the director of the public governance with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris. He leads a team of uh, 200 staff to support governments in improving their public sector performance for inclusive growth and the comp competitiveness of their economies. Mr. Alter joined OECD in 1991 and has held positions like Chief of Staff of OECD, Secretary General, Mr. Angel Aquirio, and worked in various OECD departments but I must indicate that prior to joining the OECD, Mr. Alter was an economist in the International Monetary Fund. He is currently also a member of the advisory group of the YEF Global Risk Report. Uh, in Italia, he's expected to cover within the seven minutes allocated to him the following three questions. What are the means of achieving coherence across different post-2015 frameworks and agreements? But also, how can international cooperation be promoted and strengthened to ensure coherence? And secondly, what are the key investment metrics and tools that the OECD countries or maybe OECD promotes to ensure international cooperation in the field of disaster risk reduction. But also, he's expected to share some good practices, success stories, and lessons learned in tracking development finance and highlighting the role of peer reviews in promoting cooperation. Mr. Alter, thank you very much, and also thank you very much for availing yourself to replace uh, Mr. Rintaro Tamaki. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a great pleasure to be here, of course, and uh, with the uh, exquisite uh, support of my um, neighbors to the right, I made it and got also to a microphone. So thank you so much. Uh, I just, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with the question, of course. Uh, it uh, encourages me to focus perhaps on something that uh, we haven't uh, touched upon so much until now, but I think it's important. It's simply the question, how actually do countries implement? How? I mean, not just how much and where, but how you do it. And believe me, this is a pretty challenging task for countries, and it's not an issue of developed or not developed, I can assure you as well. We have looked at it, and when you check the countries that are part of the OECD formally, there are many, many more that work with us, but formally we have 35 member countries. If you ask them, what do you do about risk management and risk reduction, the answers will be quite surprising, to say the least. Because the challenge is that we talk about coherence, not really a new concept, but a concept that always comes back to those three, at least in my view, three really important qualities. There is something to be said about inclusiveness. Do we bring the players at the table when we implement? The players that count, the first that count, are actually the people that live in countries, the citizens. But I think there are others, you know, I don't go there, but I will just say inclusiveness. The second is, how do we adjust our structures? Most governments deal with issues in a very siloed approach. Risk reduction is exactly the opposite. It requires coordination and integrated policy development. Very, very important, but apparently not so easy to do. And the third issue is, of course, experiences. I can uh, tell you that 
The OECD is well known for its peer review process. Our DAC members, the Development Assistance Committee members, know about that. The last one was Australia. Very, very interesting when you think about it, what the Australians are putting in place to make sure that, yes, expenditure for risk reduction is not only what you invest in that portfolio, but many other areas do help and support the same objective. How do you bring this together? If you look for ways to have that exchange, and I think the international community should really focus a lot on making experience known. I mean experience that have shown how it works, but also experience how it doesn't work. Failures is just part of good policy, and therefore sharing them is as usually a little more complicated, takes a little more courage, but it's extremely helpful to do so. So what I would like to say really here in this context, we're trying to think through specific areas with the countries concerned, but also with the donors. For example, you have to get away from annual budget allocations if you talk about investment. It will need multi-annual funding processes, because nothing of that is being done in a year, not even in a second year. So it means it is a question of allocating money, giving a good sense of what is available in monetary terms, but also of assistance otherwise to ensure that these processes are going well. And my last point that I want to make here today Inclusiveness is something that we see now, of course, in the SDGs and also in the climate discussion very often as a demand. It has to be inclusive. But we need to be sure that we mobilize the people who are affected. Inclusiveness means to talk, but more importantly, to listen to the people that mostly have fantastic ideas how to do better. Let's just start and not forget that that is part of our obligation, but also, I think, of the reward of international cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your input, which was within the allocated time. Now, without any waste of time, uh, I'm going to hand over uh, to our fourth speaker, uh, Ms. Heidi Schroederas Fox. Ms. Heidi is the director of the United Nations Office of the High Representative for the Least Developed Countries landlocked uh, developing countries and small island developing states. Previously, she served as deputy facilitator for the 2012 conference on the establishment of a zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East and also as a head of policy issues for the office of the president of the United Nations General Assembly. She is an ambassador in the, in the Finnish Foreign Service, has held diplomatic post in Paris, Washington, D.C., Tel Aviv, and Pretoria, uh, and served as deputy permanent representative of Finland to the UN in New York. She is expected in Italia to cover three questions within the seven minutes allocated to her. The first one will be on the key needs of countries with special needs. The second one will be on how does technology transfer support countries with special needs, but also what role does and can the technolo technology bank for LDCs play in this regard. And lastly, 
We expect her to share some good practices, success stories, and lessons learned in promoting international cooperation. Ms. Shrulis Fox, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, for that comprehensive introduction. Uh, very kind of you. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today, this afternoon, and represent the UN system in this panel. And uh, mine is an office. We are the office of the least developed, landlocked, and small island developing states. And that consists of 92 member states of the United Nations that are the most vulnerable for one reason or another. And of course, these countries are also very often disproportionately affected by um, disasters and crises. And at the same time, they have the least capacity to deal with both the preparedness side and then also the after effects of disasters and rebuilding. So these are countries that really have uh, very special needs when it comes to um, uh, disaster risk reduction. Uh, examples are many, of course. We have the earthquake 2015 in Nepal, uh, which affected 5.6 million people. And estimates are that rebuilding uh, after that costs some 7 billion which is approximately one-third of the annual GDP of Nepal. Also, in the case of Vanuatu, um, Cyclone Pam struck the country in 2015, and it's the largest cyclone ever to hit the Pacific, and it, it, it was estimated that 95% of the crops was destroyed um, after the leaving really communities in, in dire strait uh, with uh, food uh, insecurity. And of course, the earthquake in Haiti also resulted in 200,000 deaths and, and a huge amount in rebuilding. Um, uh, I think uh, the loss was estimated at about 120% of Haiti's GDP. So just uh, that to say how disproportionately these countries are affected. And for many of these countries, the increased indebtedness and constrained fiscal space can also have long-term development consequences leading to a vicious cycle where low um, uh, growth leads to a lack of resources to build resilience to future disasters. Further compounding the challenges, the incidence of climate-related disasters in magnifying the risks and increasing the cost for these countries. Globally, and over the, four, the last 40 years, we have seen a doubling of the number of weather and climate-related disasters. So while many of these countries have made strides in implementing the disaster risk reduction at the national and also regional levels, many gaps remain and efforts often do, new, do not meet the magnitude of the challenge. Nonetheless, we know that these groups of countries are among those that stand to gain the greatest if investment in reducing disaster risks can effectively be leveraged. So in this regard, of course, it has been mentioned here already, uh, financing is critical. LDCs, for instance, need fast-tracked access to existing programs and measures, including the disaster risk uh, financing and insurance program of the World Bank and the rapid financing instru instrument of the IMF, as well as various other concessional lending facilities. Recent years have seen the development of a number of innovative regional risk insurance pools. Uh, one was mentioned already uh, uh, by my colleague, uh, the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. Um, and similarly, the Pacific Island countries uh, initiated on, pilot, on, a, on a pilot basis a regional insurance pooling facility in 2013, uh, the uh, Pacific Disaster Financing and Insurance Program. And in Seychelles, we recently saw the first ever climate adaptation debt restructuring. It provides Seychelles with an innovative financial tool to restructure its debt and allow its national government to free capital streams and direct them towards climate change adaptation, which also has added benefit of building resilience uh, to its communities. Other cities and financial institutions have taken interest in the uh, replicability of this model, and this has the um, potential also to boost disaster risk reduction efforts in these countries. 
International partners need to strengthen their role in leveraging the resources and tailor-made support for these uh, groups of countries because every country is a little bit different and really needs uh, tailor-made solutions for its country's needs, for its communities. This requires endeavors ranging from improving access to technology, also discussed here earlier already, better access to financing for early warning systems, building adaptive and institutional capacities, sharing best practices, utilizing traditional knowledge, and mainstreaming disaster risk reduction across all sectors of society. And I, as I alluded to earlier, one area where vulnerable countries, in particular the LDCs, require support is that of access to uh, appropriate technology. Um, the Istanbul Program of Action, which is a program of action for the least developed countries for the next 10 years, um, called for the establishment of a technology bank dedicated to the, to the needs of the least developed countries. Uh, so this bank is a major step forward uh, for the LDCs to really enhance science, technology and innovation and the integration of technology into development. And our office is leading the um, efforts at the moment and making sure that this technology bank is fully operationalized this year. Uh, so the different uh, already existing mechanisms can be, um, uh, can be included as we move on with the um, technology bank. The UN system is really working hard to make uh, uh, providing effective and coherent support to the implementation of the Sendai framework. And there's a, um, a leadership group on disaster risk reduction, which is uh, chaired by the special representative. And this plan of action is really uh, moving forward with the implementation. And within that plan of action, the special needs of these vulnerable countries are very much uh, taken into consideration. So um, let me finish by saying that it's also important when we speak about the role of international cooperation, we should not forget cooperation with local communities. And this was what our colleague from OECD was mentioning. We must listen to those who are the most vulnerable and live with disaster on a daily basis. The voice of the local community is important as, we, uh, better and, as they can better identify their needs on reducing their risks and what resources they require to build resilience. Um, the unprecedented global prosperity, rapid advances in science, technology and innovation and, and uh, uh, the citizens of LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS should not remain entrapped in a vicious cycle of poverty, deprivation and vulnerability. It is only a moral imperative that it is the enlightened interest of the international community to help bring about structural transformation to these countries and help them implement the Sendai framework and other global agreements. While disasters are a fact of life for these countries, their impacts should not be. And we should do this in the spirit of the SDGs of leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Schroeder Fox, for your intervention. Now I'm going to call our last speaker. Uh, our last speaker is Ms. Sandra Wu. Ms. Sandra Wu is the chairperson of the, uh, and the CEO of uh, Kukusai Kogio, which is a, a, a private company, a leading Japanese engineering consultancy and project management specialist in geospatial information, disaster risk reduction management, infrastructure and event development and management, and green energy. She is also a board member of the UNICDR's Private Sector Alliance and was chair of the private sector partnership from 2013 to 2015. Over to you, Sandra. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the CEO of a geospatial information-based company. And uh, disaster risk reduction is one of uh, our key business area. And today, I would like to share our experience and provide our view uh, on the international cooperation. Um, in Japan, we are one of the key producer of hazard maps, which are used by local government and the national uh, communities um, communicate the risk information. And we have years of expertise in assisting 
and the planning and the mitigation of risk related to landslides, tsunami, volcanoes, and uh, heavy snow and so on. We are also experts in survey and the mapping, including the post-disaster rapid assessment. And what we learn in Japan, we also faster transfer to developing country. Kokusai Kogyo has already 50 years of history working in the field of uh, uh, international cooperation, particularly technology transfer, and mainly through the Japan International Cooperation Agency. And our development experts and the professionals bring their expertise learned in Japan to various other countries. And as a company, we support this work as part of our corporate vision to bring a sustainable future one step closer. So what are some those examples? Here are some examples. In 2011, a severe drought occurred in East Africa in which many died or were displaced. And to help out a Somali refugee camp located in Ethiopia, we conducted a very precise geological survey, mapped the groundwater potential, and dug a well over 500 meters deep to deliver water. And also in 2011, during the Thailand floods, we surveyed the entire catchment basin of the Chao Phraya River, 24,000 kilometers square, creating a precise digital elevation map in a very short period of time for flood mitigation planning. And we conducted the capacity development and the technology transfer pro project on landslide risk in India, Sri Lanka, and Brazil, and many other countries as well. Whether the assistance is bilateral or multilateral, transfer of technologies actually draw on the expertise and the technical knowledge of the, engin of the engineers and the experts. And most, if not all, of them are from engineering consulting company among the private sector. So companies like Saikogyo, with your business wins in both uh, in Japan and other overseas, serve to bring the latest tech technology and the know-how developed in Japan to developing countries. But ODA cannot cover all the work that must be done to achieve the Sendai Framework goals. And the real work ahead must be done by the developing countries. And a company such as ours actually can assist the people in developing country to do this work through business to business or private private cooperation. Perhaps the way forward is for the international cooperation to pave the way and create an enabling environment for private private international cooperation through business relationship. I also want to answer the uh, second question on sustainability uh, for an example from our area of expertise, uh, which is mapping and geospatial information. There is an issue that we frequently encounter uh, when we engage with developing country outside the frame of the ODA. Maps and uh, hazard map are necessary tools for DRR and they convey the risk information to the people in the community. They help you plan, they help you in drills, and they help you evacuate. Yet, each time we try to assist a city in developing country to produce their hazard map, we run into a cost problem. And we find that the de developing an ordinary hazard map can be more costly in developing countries because the basic map information on which they are developed is not shared or available for use in free manners. And more often than not, the problem is that there is no system in place for sharing and use across department and agencies. The basic map, map information is created from scratch 
again and again for each new purpose by each different user at high cost. And in contrast, in Japan, one set of basic map information is used by many parties. National and the local governments in Japan make it a priority to maintain accurate, updated basic map information and share them. It is made available to private sector to build new tools and interfaces that assist in disaster risk management, maintenance of utility, and so on. And this is a system of sharing and the resulting basic map information serve as an enabling environment for the private sector. And when international cooperation is used to build an enabling environment, which in my field uh, would be good uh, basic map information and a system of sharing, then it becomes more sustainable because developing countries will be able to mobilize their own private sector resources within their countries. And it is also the role, the role of a company like ours to bring our know-how and expertise to our business partner in these countries. And working together in private-private cooperation that organically results in the transfer of technology within a business relationship. And long term, these partners would contribute to their own country's development and growth. And that growing our partners in, to this point would be one of the ways a company such as ours would contribute to sustainability and the realization of the Sendai Framework goals. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think let's once more put a round of applause for our speakers. I think uh, they have done their best. I must indicate that in the interest of time, uh, we, we, we are going now to entertain uh, our dis discussants. I mean, I'm going to open, before I open the floor for questions, I am going to allow uh, uh, two discussants, I mean, to take us through. But I must indicate that uh, once more, we, we are quite impressed by the level of pre uh, 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 preparedness that has been shared by our various speakers. It really shows that uh, they have really taken some time to, p to prepare for this working session. And once more, from, from our side, as a chair, I must indicate that I'm very, very uh, appreciative of the effort that you put in preparing this. We will come back to summary, and uh, of course, uh, uh, we'll come back to some of the key points that emerged, I mean, from uh, their submissions at a later stage. For now, allow me to introduce our first discussant. Our first discussant is Mr. Joseph Hess. Mr. Joseph Hess is a Vice Director, the Federal Office for uh, Environment in Switzerland. He, he will be making his submission from the floor. Uh, Mr. Joseph Hess, you are more than welcome. Please, you are, you are welcome to make your submission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this kind introduction. Distinguished Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, let me extend first my sincerest thanks to the organizers and the host country for this valuable conference. Switzerland is a mountainous country and already in the past it was affected by numerous and heavy disasters and this will go on, especially due to climate change. This situation learned us to build up a more than 100 years old tradition in managing natural hazards. Many principles and ideas have been developed and I think some of them fit very well with the topic of this uh, important meeting we have just now. One of the principles is to apply integrated risk management which includes not only response but also prevention 
and preparedness before an event and rehabilitation after an event. And this inclusive view has proven most success successful. Another idea and principle is that risk management should include all aspects of sustainability, economic, ecologic and social aspects. And this is a key factor to develop effective and well accepted projects. It is also fully in line with coherence, which is an important topic in this conference and in this event. A third idea I would like to share with you is that the role of prevention should be strengthened. This is in line with making communities more resilient, as we have heard many times today and which we will hear again. We know and we have experienced that one US dollar or one Swiss franc invested in prevention saves five to ten times the money by avoiding damages. And knowing that at the moment only 10% of DRR related expenses are spent in prevention, I must say this is too little. We have to change these shares. Switzerland will allocate one-sixth of the total humanitarian aid budget to disaster resilience and preventive measures in the coming four years. A fourth idea I bring to the audience, we must learn to focalize the complex landscapes of action and of financing. Further fragmentation should be avoided and silos must be overcome, as we have heard already from the distinguished panelists. And finally, a fifth thing is the following knowledge transfer and data transfer must be emphasized and enhanced among practitioners among academias, among scientists. In this context, context, allow me to mention a new report, Safer Lives and Livelihoods in Mountains, in Mountains, Making the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction Work for Sustainable Mountain Development. This report might be found in the marketplace, which is building up one uh, floor up from us and I cordially invite you to visit these marketplaces and also the Swiss stand where you will find this report. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hess. <laughs> Our second discussant also from the floor will be Ms. Monica Acosta. Uh, Ms. Monica Acosta is the head of the emergency department uh, for, for Humanitarian Action, the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation, MFA, Spain. Gracias, gracias, señor presidente. Y felicitaciones a los organizadores del evento. En, para España, la reducción de riesgos ante desastres es una prioridad de nuestra cooperación. Y por ello, nos gustaría compartir algunas buenas prácticas que España está impulsando en dos ámbitos principalmente en el apoyo a las políticas de adaptación al cambio climático y en el de la acción humanitaria. En el primer ámbito y en el marco de la cooperación regional, España forma parte del programa Euroclima Plus, financiado por la Unión Europea, que lucha contra el cambio climático en América Latina. La Agencia Española de Cooperación Internacional se suma al programa Euroclima Plus, junto con AF de Francia, en dos ámbitos en el de gestión del agua con una perspectiva de resiliencia urbana y en el de reducción y gestión de riesgos ante desastres. En este último ámbito estamos desarrollando una convocatoria de proyectos conjunta para identificar y financiar proyectos innovadores y relevantes a ser posible con un enfoque regional que provienen de una amplia gama de que provengan de una gama amplia de actores como son organizaciones gubernamentales, ONGs, organismos internacionales, redes e instituciones de investigación y el sector privado. 
El presupuesto de la convocatoria es de unos 8 millones de euros aproximadamente y las prioridades son las sequías e inundaciones con un enfoque de prevención. En este sentido, se está preparando la primera reunión regional donde se lanzará la convocatoria a finales de junio en Cartagena de Indias. Vinculado también a la lucha contra el cambio climático, AECI está implementando un programa regional para América Latina llamada Auroclima, con líneas de trabajo, entre otros, tendentes a promover una agricultura resistente al clima y medidas de adaptación al cambio climático que ayuden a reducir los riesgos ante desastres. En el ámbito del asociacionalismo sectorial promovido por España, se han creado varias redes iberoamericanas, como son la Conferencia de Directores de los Servicios Meteorológicos e Hidrológicos Iberoamericanos, la Conferencia de Directores Iberoamericanos del Agua y la Red Iberoamericana de Oficinas de Cambio Climático. Estas redes están coordinadas por diferentes instituciones del Ministerio de Agricultura y Pesca, Alimentación y Medio Ambiente de España y constituyen foros de discusión, intercambio de experiencias y desarrollo de actividades en la prevención de desastres de origen hidrometeorológico. Estas actividades, a su vez, son de gran interés para la Asociación Iberoamericana de Organismos Gubernamentales de Defensa y Protección Civil, que al reunir a todas estas instituciones en la región se puede convertir en un interlocutor fundamental a la hora de diseñar actividades conjuntas encaminadas a la protección de vidas y bienes frente a los fenómenos hidrometeorológicos adversos. En el ámbito de Naciones Unidas, España apoya la iniciativa de Pobreza y Medio Ambiente en América Latina y Caribe, implementado por PNUD y PENUMA, y también el programa Regata, una plataforma regional para la transferencia de tecnología y acción para enfrentar el cambio climático en América Latina. En el ámbito de acción, de acción humanitaria, eh, España tiene una oficina técnica de cooperación regional en temas de preparación ante desastres en Panamá, eh, vinculada a la plataforma logística regional de UNHRD para atención a catástrofes. Además, también gestionamos y financiamos otra plataforma de recursos de UNHRD en las Palmas de Gran Canaria que da apoyo a África Occidental. Igualmente, para mejorar la respuesta a acción humanitaria española en emergencias, se ha puesto en marcha el proyecto STAR, que es un hospital de campaña de segundo nivel con capacidad quirúrgica y hospitalización, que incluye un grupo de expertos que están fortaleciendo capacidades de preparación ante desastres en países proclives a catástrofes, principalmente en dos ejes. Eh, uno en Filipinas, donde se ha reforzado la preparación para desastres eh, del Ministerio de Salud y otro para América Latina, con la Organización Panamericana de Salud eh, como socio principal. Eh, además, también eh, junto con el Ministerio de Interior damos formación a través del programa Interconecta, impartiendo cursos de materias relacionadas con prevención de riesgos y protección civil en centros de formación de la ECIT en América Latina. En conclusión... España apuesta de manera decidida por la promoción de reducción de riesgos ante desastres y colabora con diversos actores para lograr fortalecer las capacidades de nuestros países socios tanto en el ámbito de la adaptación al cambio climático como en la acción humanitaria. Y así lo seguiré haciendo en los próximos años. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, what will happen now, uh, after the two input that were very, very helpful to complement our speaker's input. We are now going to allow, just for a limited uh, period of time, because we are, we are pressurized by time, we are now going to allow to open the floor for discussion, uh, because we only have uh, 20 minutes to undertake this important exercise. I am going to request Uh, participant to be very, very precise on their comments and questions, so as we can accommodate more submissions. But also, uh, for you to be noted, please use your nameplate, uh, raise your nameplate and uh, you will be attended to, so as you can be added to the speaker's list. You, can, uh, you are allowed to make your questions, but also you are allowed to uh, make a comment. As indicated earlier, please bear in mind that that should not go beyond one minute. Now the floor is open for questions, comments, and uh, submissions from the participants. The Secretariat, please help us. Can I speak? Can I speak? Uh, my name is Avi Rabinovich. I'm coming uh, from Israel. I have your two hats. I'm the advisor to the Ministry of Regional Cooperation in Israel, 
and I am also the Secretary General of international organization called LACDA, Local Authorities Confronting Disaster and Emergencies. This conference is speak about from words into actions. I do hope that this uh, gathering is not NATO. What is NATO? No action, talk only. I do hope, uh, <clears throat> on behalf of the Ministry of Regional Cooperation, to have the assistance of this gathering to enable us to cooperate with our neighbors because in disaster there are no borders, not political issues, it is all only human being. And therefore I'm calling those who can assist to be a venue for meetings with our neighbors to raise up and to join us. It's not only a question of money because the ministry is ready to give the support, the finance support for such gathering, but we need the venue to make this happen. And this is very important as human being. Secondly, on the head of the local authorities aspect, all the times we see a lot of talks about the importance of local government. We always in the slides, number one, because we are the first to tackle with the emergencies and, and the disaster, and last to remain with the disaster. But this is remain only on the slides. When it's come to implementation, we are in the last in, in the list to receive the assistant, and we have to talk together not only as UNISDR make the resilient cities, how we implement it. Third point, you mentioned private to private sector cooperation. Normally what's happened in conferences, whatever it not be, the private sector is invited to present the innovation. But after there, each one go home. Did he succeed to make some businesses or not? I'm calling to, to this initiative to come together with us because at the end of the year in the city of Marathon in Greece, we are going to hold an international conference on local authorities confronting disaster and emergencies. And I suggest to make a special session for the private sector, not only to present your uh, uh, innovations, but also to sit together and to lead such an action in order to bring the private sector to be integrated with the public sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The speaker went far beyond the allocated one minute, so let's not copy from him, or else we, we might undermine the time allocated to us. Uh, to my fellow panelists, please take note of some of the questions, especially those questions that are specific to your uh, intervention because after this, I will accord you an opportunity to also uh, respond. Thank you. The next uh, participant. Thank you. My name is uh, Sandra Keme. I'm the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth DRR Focal Point for Africa. Um, my comment is from Rolf Alta when he mentioned um, inclusiveness. And I think it's a very important point that he mentioned that is not just about coherence, but also inclusiveness. Last year, November, I was in Mauritius, and the African youth made a statement about how to meaningfully be engaged. We are very happy to mention that the Regional Office for Africa, for ISDR, has this year put in place a strategy to meaningfully engage youth. So I would like to call on all participants here to join with them, to join with us, so that we can be able to implement it. Thank you. And uh, we have a side event, children and new side event on Friday. We'd like to invite you to showcase what youth are already doing everywhere, I mean globally, so that you can be able to scale up our efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to, there is a lady there with a, an orange outfit. In. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Annie Kiara. I represent the NIA network. Well, my question is uh, to the companies that are doing uh, technology. The Global South, um, in my estimation, is not 
Taburalasa when it comes to technology. It is, there is a lot happening there, and I come from Kenya. There is a program that is called uh, Ushahindi that did a lot for us during the post-election violence. So part of the reason why technology doesn't work in the developing world is that uh, sometimes it comes from the West and it is copy-pasted in an environment where it doesn't fit. Then it becomes unsustainable. My recommendation would be, why not work with, with the technology that is available locally and grow it organically to where you are instead of trying to copy paste what you already have in the West to a context that is not necessarily re receptive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let's take the last hand. Uh, look, I'm going to exercise leniency because I can see there is also another hand for, for another lady. Let's, let's, let's go to that side. Uh, the gentleman there with spectacles. I'm sorry because you are not raising your, your name text there, so it's difficult for me to recognize who you are. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Rohan Richards uh, from the National Spatial Data Management Division in Jamaica. I want to thank the panelists um, for their interventions. Um, I'm going to disguise my comment as a question uh, directed principally to Laura and Ingrid. Uh, how easy is it uh, for uh, countries to actually access some of these insurance funds, um, Ingrid, which you spoke about, and because of the different modalities associated with drawdown from these funds? And shouldn't the emphasis be placed on integration of the insurance into a kind of a holistic and transformative uh, resilience approach as opposed to uh, just post response? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take the last question, the lady at the back. If we still have time, we'll do the second round of question. Noted, noted, your hands are noted. Thank you. My name is Erica Bauer, and I'm here with the United Nations Refugee Agency. I want to thank uh, the Honorable Chair for his references to the importance of recognizing both internal and cross-border displacement in the context of disasters and the adverse effects of climate change. And thanks, thanks also to all of the panelists for their excellent contributions today. I'd like to emphasize and call to the participants to this conference to improve coordination between actors at different levels on this issue of disaster displacement, international, regional, sub-regional, et cetera, as well as increased dialogue between actors from different related agendas. This includes climate change, disaster risk reduction, migration, displacement, human rights, development, et cetera and also call to promote partnerships, collaborative action, and knowledge sharing, as well as capacity building amongst these actors. And finally, emphasize the importance of exploring opportunities for resource mobilization within the framework of international financial mechanisms at the regional and international levels to respond to disaster displacement and to find durable solutions to displacement. And finally, a question directed at the representative from Germany. What do you see as the role of the platform on disaster displacement, which is led by, by Germany, uh, to ensure international co cooperation and uh, policy coherence across these varied sectors in the implementation of the Sendai framework and beyond? Thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to allow uh, the high table to respond. And if we still have time, we will then entertain the second round of questions. We will start with uh, yourself, uh, Heidi, and then we'll come this way. Um, thank you very much. Briefly, just a few uh, observations to the comments, uh, excellent comments. Thank you very much. To the gentleman uh, who was talking about from words to action, I think this is an extremely important point. And when we look at the, the, how the UN is moving forward in the implementation of the Sendai framework, it really is important to make sure that this global framework is worked at the regional level and then also in the country offices where the UN is doing work at the local level. And as I mentioned in my presentation, there has to be local solutions where the local needs and the local knowledge uh, is taken into, uh, into consideration. And this is very much in the heart of the work as we are moving forward with this senior leadership um, 
group at the UN and thinking about how to best uh, implement the uh, Sendai framework. Um, inclusiveness, yes, I think a uh, very uh, important point and maybe just a comment on the technology because this is a key, uh, key factor. Um, the technology bank for the LDCs, for the least developed countries, Many have asked, why do we need a, a, a bank that looks at the specific needs for the LDCs? We need it because it has not worked in the past. The LDCs are really lagging behind when it comes to their access to technology and also, like the lady was saying, the adaptation of the technology to the local needs. And this is what the technology bank is there for. We are working on its operationalization during this year. Uh, it will help all the 48 uh, uh, LDCs in providing them access and also to helping the local communities in providing um, uh, help in policy level as well. So these are perhaps those points that I would comment on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. Let's allow uh, Ingrid to respond. Yeah, a couple of questions were raised. Um, let me... <clears throat> pick out of them um, two or three. Um, the, the insurance um, schemes, um, how do we actually integrate them in a more holistic and transformative resilience approach? It's absolutely right. As I said, this is not a sil silver bullet for, for all kinds of circumstances. So normally, um, in our development cooperation, we start by giving, supporting uh, developing countries in, for instance, adaptation planning. Um, so that the effects of climate change can be factored into normal development um, planning. Um, we try to improve the resilience at the community level um, by capacity building or specific infrastructure measures um, and so forth. So this is like a continuum, how do you actually deal with the impact that um, is out there due to climate change? Get get communities prepared, or those communities that actually face a higher risk. We know that, for instance, in the coastal areas, um, cities and smaller communities are going to face a higher risk. So there are a couple of preventive measures that we can already take, but there is one remaining risk, because still a disaster can hit an extreme weather event. And what happens then? And I think insurance schemes provide an additional caution because you bring in private sector resources, you avoid that actually your own budgetary resources are depleted or that you wait too long until the humanitarian assistance arrives. And we have seen this in Chad, we have seen this in Nigeria, we have seen this in Kenya and other countries, that, that actually the communities benefit because the assistance arrives quicker because the funding is available earlier than if you wait for the normal, uh, normal procedures. So it's one one instrument among, among others, um, but it provides additional opportunities. Um, the disaster displacement um, action, um, the coherence among actors, um, an exchange of, of um, knowledge in this respect. I think that the platform for disaster displacement is such a forum actually to move the agenda forward. Um, and it puts additional pressure also on governance, coherence, and different actors within government to take uh, to acknowledge that, that due to climate change, we are facing more um, displacements. So the question is, of course, um, what could be concrete, concrete action? I think for, um, especially I see a big value added in the platform to raise awareness um, for advocacy and for actually moving forward a normative framework in the medium term that would give us a more robust uh, platform um, for, for action. With respect to concrete cooperation on the ground for displaced people due to disasters or extreme weather events um, provoked by climate change, I think when I listen to the many panelists and also to your experience, then I think that we have already many, many good tools in place. The big issue is to bring these different silos together and act in a coherent way on the ground. I think the key point in this respect is that the governments of those countries that are being hit, that they are in the lead, and that we actually build the capacity on the ground at the level of governments and communities that they can be in the lead and make the different tools and apply them in a very coherent manner. Finally, on technology transfer. Certainly, I would agree um, uh, with the comment from the floor. There are still many, many examples where technology transfer hasn't worked out properly. 
But we also have many, many good examples already in place, especially when it comes to DRR. For instance, in the German case, first we ask ourselves, what kind of technology do we have available in Germany that might be actually helpful for North-South cooperation? And we first we did a mapping. And then we received actually an, um, a request from the Philippines because communities in the Philippines were faced with flash floods over and over again. And the question was, is there anything available in Germany that could be of help to the Philippines? And we, we started to work together, and it was not a one-way street. It was actually a very interactive dialogue. The instruments that the technology from Germany was actually applied to the Philippine circumstances. And this was such an interesting case that Vietnam and later on Myanmar and also other countries of the region asked for support to do the same. So we have also good examples, and I think the issue is now how do we make sure that those examples can be scaled up and um, be brought to more communities. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Uh, I'm going to ask Laura to uh, provide her response. Thank you. I'll be brief since I think my colleagues have covered most. But on this question on insurance, there's a number of different insurance products or insurance type products that are available. So one of the ones we use, I mentioned earlier, the catastrophic drawdown um, facility that countries can use that, that borrow from the World Bank or from IDA. And what's nice about this is it's just a, a amount of cash that's available if they need it and they, they declare a disaster, then they have access to the funds. And the other benefit of this product is to prepare it, we put in place all the planning and preparation and risk assessment and help countries develop their whole um, financial preparation scheme. So that's a very important one. The second one that um, my colleagues have mentioned on the Caribbean Risk Insurance Facility and, and PCRAFI in the Pacific, which is a pilot, these are parametric insurance schemes where the countries have come together and formed a group where they pay in a premium and then when um, something happens, like a certain wind speed is reached or a certain land speed after an earthquake is reached, then it pays out immediately the next day these countries get money. And we've been able to help some of the poorer countries actually pay the premiums for these these products. We also have in a number of countries rainfall um, insurance for agricultural risk. And then I think as Ingrid mentioned um, before, we've put in a lot of our investment lendings, zero components, where we can then quickly reallocate. So the project is up and running, but when a disaster hits and the, the country needs some funds, we can reallocate to those components. There are a number of other products, but I want to stop there. I just wanted to, this question on technology, I think it's very important, the point you make about it, adapting locally, but also we don't want countries to miss out on some of the fantastic technological in, innovations that are coming. I just mentioned one that's really cool. We've been using social media um, through cell phone technology to do some post-disaster um, needs assessments, for instance, in eastern Ukraine or now in Syria. We've done it in a number of other countries. And so bringing technology to bear on this agenda is, is really quite exciting, and we want our countries to, to benefit from that. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Sandra? Thank you. Um, uh, I want to respond actually beyond uh, what you just mentioned about the technology. Actually, the um, DRR technology actually is consistently revolving, and among the and even the latest, those uh, cutting edge te technology, which is um, within the reach of the developing country, and lots of those uh, uh, leading technology like a drone, smartphone, already adopted by a lot of developed country already, but this. Technology, most of them are driven by the private sectors. And the key, if you want, if you want to make it sustainable, I think the key is to mobilize your local private sector resources and to enrich your locally available private sector expertise. And then the company um, like ours can help uh, to improve the adoption of the recent technology through the private-private cooperation. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, Rolf, I'm not sure if you have anything that you want to submit. Technology. Uh, thank you very much. I would perhaps just use those uh, final moments of this fantastic discussion, but also the presentations, just to sh remind us, obviously, 
risk reduction and international cooperation on risk reduction has a multitude of really facets that have to be pursued. I mean, this isn't, there isn't one little screw that we need to turn and then it will work. It's a multitude of initiatives and then, of course, of action. And it's true, most of it is transborder, and therefore it should be actually lent itself quite naturally to cooperation at the international level. I will say to our friend from Israel, uh, please, believe me, if you want to make a venue, there is a venue which is called the OECD in Paris, anytime. If you stop by, we will talk about this with great pleasure. But I would like to say to our chairman, Mr. Chairman, we'd be nice when you go, since you are political leader, you are a political leader. I think it would be worthwhile to think about this aim of creating and working on a culture of risk reduction, a culture of risk reduction that includes all and is inclusive in itself if everybody really follows up on it. And it starts, of course, also with our political leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers. I would like to apologize to the two hands that I noted earlier. Uh, because of time constraints, uh, I'm going to allow uh, the speakers to make their final concluding remarks, but also uh, request those two hands that I noted to forward their questions to the high table so as we are able to uh, process them accordingly. Uh, I will start with you, Heidi, to make your closing remarks. Um, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, we have already had a very fruitful discussion and uh, there's not uh, a whole lot more to um, add to it other than to say that as we move forward on the implementation of the Sendai, the special needs of the least developed countries, the landlocked and the small islands, have to be in the center of the implementation of these frameworks, helping them uh, deal and prepare and deal with disasters, helping with their special needs on technology and support, financial needs and so on, has to be in the heart of the work that we do. And, uh, and our office is very much looking forward to working together with all of you um, in this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adi. Uh, Laura? So as one of the largest sources of expertise in finance for disaster risk management in the developing world, we are committed to making DRM a priority and mainstream it in all of our work, in all of its aspects, from ex-ante planning, preparation and prevention, to ex-post recovery and reconstruction. And we will do it using all the tools we have available, from policy-based lending, to resilient investment lending, technical assistance and capacity building, analysis, risk information tools, and platforms that we can make available to everyone, insurance and other de-risking products we didn't talk about today, but really to build the environment for, for more private investment. And we're committed to doing this in a completely inclusive manner and with a focus on the poorest and the most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sandra? Thank you. Um, as a member, of, as a board member of UNISDR Private Sector Initiative Arise, and as a CEO of a company, we fully understand uh, achieve, to achieve the Sendai framework goals, we need to take the action. And we are fully committed to taking uh, the actions. And as a CEO, what I need to do is really fast track the project that take the form of a private and private partnership and involving the recent um, DRR technology and in a developing country as part of our business activities. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, Rolf? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much to my panelists for a fantastic debate. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, that also uh, indicated their commitment, but there are a few points that I think uh, I should uh, uh, bring to your attention. Uh, some of the key points that uh, will require the, the high level, I mean the political uh, forum to entertain. The first point is uh, the improved 
inter, in, international cooperation for, for disaster risk reduction on different levels. Here, I think emphasis has been put on cooperation, which can be mastered if all role players work together and join hands as they provide uh, this particular cooperation. And secondly, the in in encouraging partnership that engage the private sector, but also the emphasis on all efforts to reduce exposure to disaster risk will require actions across society. This should be complemented by appropriate investment instruments, including innovative finance mechanisms where public and private interests are properly aligned. And also there was an emphasis on the need for multi-year funding to ensure if effective disaster risk reduction efforts. But also there was an emphasis on the need to improve the measurements of the cost of disasters by inter alia creating multi-hazard disaster base as well as guidelines for standardizing loss estimates. Also coming out of our discussion, a need was identified to listen to local communities as we speak of uh, the role of uh, international uh, cooperation. Another important point that I think should be taken forward is a point on integrated risk management, which will include all facets of sustainability, but also the role of prevention. Sus sustainable communities are only created if we are able to address issues of being uh, preventative. And this, of course, will take into consideration the issue of allocation of resources. But also, we need to avoid funding fragmentation because this really makes it difficult for any intervention to realize value for money. So there was a need, there was an emphasis on the need to avoid funding fragmentation. And lastly, there was a call for integration of indigenous way of disaster risk reduction and the modern technology. So that simply suggests that we should be able to domesticate some of the modern uh, methods of uh, uh, risk, disaster risk reduction that we introduce more especially to uh, those countries that are in need. So those are the, the few key points that I think emerge from the, the speakers, but also emerge from the discussions that followed, but also from submissions that were made by discussing. I think I should take this opportunity really to thank, to thank the panelists for the effort that they put in preparing for this important session, but also to thank the organizers of this important platform because this important platform accord us an opportunity to share best practices, but also to learn uh, from others. And lastly, let's also thank the host country for having opened its doors for us, I mean, to participate in this important working session. With those few words, this session is officially adjourned.